I'm just thankful for Pastor Matt for giving me this opportunity to come before y'all. Um, it's not, this is my first time ever actually going to a church to preach. Praise God. Uh, so I'm just excited for what the Lord's going to do. I believe I have a word from him. Amen. Um, so please turn your Bibles with me to Ezekiel chapter 22. Thank you, Jesus. Ezekiel 22, starting in verse 30. And those songs we were singing were just talking about that relationship we have with God. And as you really think about it, we serve an amazing God. No other God is like our God. No other God has sent His Son to die in our place. No other God Amen. ever resurrected. Uh, we serve a risen Savior. Amen. Um, no other God still has relationship with His people today. Praise God. Um, I'm thankful that He not only provided a sacrifice for sin, but He provided that relationship for us so that when we are going through stuff, we can cry out to God. Um, I'm thankful that when we're going through things in our life, when we see others, we have that privilege and opportunity to pray for them, and our God will hear us. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking talking about tonight it's intercession so with your bibles in ezekiel 22 starting in verse 30 uh the message for my uh, sermon tonight is going to be standing in the gap um starting in verse 30 the lord would say and i sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that i should not destroy it but i found none therefore have i poured out mine indignation upon them I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. And I just want to read verse 30 again, as that's my main text. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And tonight I'm just going to be talking about the ministry of intercession and the importance of it. Um, and that word intercession simply just means an act of intervening on behalf of another person. Uh, it's a topic that's not really talked about in churches anymore. It's not something you really hear someone devote a message to. A lot of people don't know what intercession is. A lot of people don't know the importance of the ministry of intercession. Um, and I believe that's why we're in the condition we're in as a church. I believe that's why we're in the condition we're in as a nation, as a family, because we don't understand intercession. We're not crying out. No one is standing in that gap. No one is making up that hedge. And this is an important lesson for us to learn to apply to our own lives, to see the hand of God move within us. Um, and I firmly believe if the church would get back on its knees and cry out to God that we wouldn't see so much sin in the world today. We wouldn't see the wickedness be fulfilled. We, uh, if we cried out for God, I believe we would see revival once again, a revival mm -hmm. that would sweep across this world, that would bring, or bring souls to God, that we would not be living in a dead church. If the church understood intercession and cried out to God and prayed for Him, we would see people come to Christ in ways we've never seen before. Um, but he's just looking for someone to stand in the gap. He's looking for someone willing to make that hedge tonight. And uh, when I'm finished preaching today or tonight, we're going to be praying for souls to come into the kingdom. Um, we'll be praying for your family member, your friend, your neighbor, uh, your coworker, whoever it is. We're going to be praying for them to come into the kingdom. And I'm believing that God's going to meet with us tonight. I'm believing God's going to hear those cries of intercession begin to move on behalf of them. Um, I'm believing that you're going to get a text from your son who's off doing drugs, that he just came back to God. I'm believing you're going to get a text from your backslidden sister saying, I just got right with the Lord. And I'm believing that in the next couple of days, you're going to get that call from your dad who's saying, I don't know how to get saved and I'm tired of living the life I'm in and I want to give over to God. I'm believing tonight that we're going to see God moving away in behalf of others as we would make up that hedge and as we would stand in the gap. I'm believing God to hear us and move on behalf of those Thank prayers um, and I know in my own life I've seen the prayer of intercession at work uh, I don't even know if I would really be saved if I didn't have a grandma that would pray for me um, and it just shows the importance for y'all pray for your family without those prayers they might not ever come into the kingdom but my grandma would consistently pray for years ever since I've been born and I would come into the kingdom and I've seen those prayers be at work within the uh, rest of my family um, probably within the last five six years uh, we're just seeing those prayers answered and everyone in our family is just coming into the kingdom of God. Um, I know for a fact without her prayers, I would not be standing behind this pulpit. Uh, I would not be in ministry without the intercession of my grandma. Um, 
I have seen the prayers of intercession work within my own life. When I pray for my brother, I see things come up. He loses his job. He becomes homeless. These things start happening as I would pray, uh, pray for the kingdom of God to be manifested in his life, saying, God, just let your grace come into him. God, let him run into your grace. Do whatever it takes for him to know you. And this is what the Lord would do. I've seen God move. I've seen God uh, bring in my father into the kingdom after praying for him. So I know intercession works and no one can tell me it doesn't work. No one can lie to me. The devil can't say these prayers are useless. I've seen it work firsthand. I am a byproduct of intercession. A lot of us in here are byproducts of intercession. Intercession needs to come back into the churches today. Um, so I just want to encourage you tonight, continue to make up that hedge, continue to stand in the gap, and don't give up until you see the hand of God move in your life. Uh, so please pray with me and pray for me. God, right now, we thank you for this opportunity you've given me. God, we thank you for this word. And we're just thankful that you are a God who hears the prayers of your children, Lord. We're thankful that you would hear the cry of intercession and that you would move on behalf to see souls saved, Lord. We're asking right now that you would begin to stir in that family, God. That you would begin to draw them by your Holy Spirit. That you would begin to move and that we would see the prayers of intercession be at work, God. That we would see your hand move and bring these souls into the kingdom. And we thank you for what you're going to do and we give you the praise and the glory and we say these things in the name of Jesus. So before I get into my text, I just want to give a little bit of background information. Um, throughout this book of Ezekiel, you'll see that God would raise up this prophet in some of the darkest days in Israel's history. Um, in a little bit, I'll read it and you'll find out that everyone in the land was corrupt. Everyone was backslidden. No one was serving God as they ought to have. Uh, it specifically mentions the prophets, the priests, the princes, and the people. Um, and throughout this book, as you're reading it, you'll find out that the majority of it is speaking of the judgment of God that is to be poured out. Um, and I was, I was studying, I found it, it was interesting. <laughs> Chapters 4 through 32 is all about the judgment of God because no one would stand in the gap. No one would intercede on behalf of this land. So that's almost 40% of this book that deals with the judgment of God. All of that would have been taken away if someone would stand in the gap. If the Lord found one person to stand in the gap, if the Lord found one person to intercede, 40% of this book wouldn't have been about judgment. It would have been about seeing souls saved. It would have been about seeing the blessings of God. So this just goes to show the importance of intercession. Um, and in the few verses before this, we see that the prophets in the land would devour souls. They were taking precious things from the people. They would make widows. And then in verse 26, we see priests would act contrary to the law of God, living a life of sinfulness, a life of immorality, and a life of unholiness, which would profane the name of God. And I'm just saying these things so you get an understanding of how wicked this place was, of how wicked Ezekiel would have to pray for these people. In verse 27, it talks about how the priests or the princes would kill people for their own selfish gain. And in verse 28, it talks about prophets would cover up all these evil things by making false prophecies. They would say, this is what the sovereign Lord says when the Lord had never spoke. This is how wicked the land was. In verse 29, we see everyone in the land, all the people would steal from each other. They would oppress the needy and that they would act unjustly to foreigners. And God being a holy God and God being a just judge, he had to pour out his wrath and he had to pour out that judgment upon the people. He had no other choice. That is what a holy God has to do. But as we'll find out in verses 30 and 31, it's not what he wanted to do. He didn't want to have to do those things, but it was in a place where he had to because he didn't have anyone praying for people. He didn't have anyone building up that hedge, and he didn't have anyone standing in the gap. And now you're saying, well, Jeremy, if he wanted to give grace and if he didn't want to give the judgment, then why would he pour out his wrath? Why did he have to do these things? And that's just what I want to bring out in verse 30. So please read with me verse 30 again. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And the beginning says, and I sought for a man among them. And as I was studying, this word saw means to strive after, and it means to desire, and it implies an effort in the searching process. It's not that God just looked real quick and he didn't see anyone, but he looked over and over and over. He was going through everyone in the land, looking, wanting someone to be praying, wanting someone to be standing in that gap. And he looked and he desired someone, but no one was to be found. He wanted to find someone, but he couldn't find a single person. 
Uh, so I've come to ask you, if you looked around this church tonight, would he find someone interceding on behalf of others? Would he find someone praying for this nation? Would he find someone praying for your pastor and praying for this church and praying for your city? If he looked around tonight, would he find people crying out for lost souls to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? If he looked in this room, would he find someone standing in that gap? He's seeking and he's looking over and over. He's desiring someone. He wants to find someone, but will someone be found in this room tonight to say, I'm tired of of seeing the world go the way it is. I'm tired of seeing my family leave and never know the love of God. I'm tired of seeing people slip into an eternal hell without me praying for them. Will he find someone standing in that gap tonight? And the verse goes on to say that he sought for someone that should make up the hedge. And that word makes up, uh, make up uh, is speaking of a building. It's something that has to be built. And that word hedge is talking about a fence and an enclosure. Uh, it's speaking about a wall. So when you literally translate it, it's saying he sought for someone to build up a wall. Saying, no, I'm not letting the enemy come in. No, I'm not letting anyone come through. I'm going to make that hedge around my family saying I've had enough with the way things are going. But I will pray and I will build up that wall. Not letting the enemy come in anymore. Um, and in these days, when you study it, that word, uh, the hedge speaking of uh, would go around someone's vineyard. And it was just an extra layer of protection through their vineyard. Um, it was they would put it around there to claim their territory. This hedge was to say what's on the inside is mine and no one else can touch it. It was a layer of protection to not let anyone else come into what they have claimed. Um, so if God looked around this room tonight, would he find someone making up that hedge? Would he find someone saying, I'm going to put a hedge around my family. No one can touch it. I'm going to put a hedge around this nation saying the enemy cannot have his way. Will he find someone making that hedge? Will you build up that wall tonight, not letting anyone come in claiming that territory for the Lord? Will someone build that hedge tonight? Um, it's time for us to rise up and say that this is our vineyard. We're not letting the enemy come in. Uh, this is mine. This is off limits for anyone else trying to get in. Uh, will you say, no, Satan, you can't have your way in this nation anymore because I'm going to put a hedge around it. And will you say, no, you can't take my family because I'm claiming this territory for the Lord. Will you claim that territory tonight? Put up the hedge, using it as a line of defense, saying no one can come in because what's in this hedge is my territory and it is for the Lord. Will you build that hedge? Will you build that wall tonight, praying for your family, praying for this nation, for this church? Will you make that hedge tonight? Will he find someone making that hedge and standing in the gap. And it goes on to say that he would seek for someone to also stand in the gap. And that word stand means to remain, to endure, and to rise up. And then the word gap is speaking of a breach and a breaking point. Um, and this phrase right here, when you study it, uh, it has military undertones to stand in the gap. Uh, the picture for this is when a man of war would see a breach or an open place where the enemy would be able to come in and he would stand there blocking the enemy from coming in. That was the gap. He would see a hole in the wall or a hole in their line of defense and he would stand there. He would raise up and he would endure and he's saying, no, the enemy cannot come in and get through this wall. And the enemy cannot come and get me because I'm protecting the people behind me. Will you stand in that gap? Will you stand in that breach and that breaking point? He would, uh, this man of war would put himself on the front lines and say, I'm not letting the enemy win today. This man of war, he would put himself in that gap and he wouldn't move an inch. He wasn't going to let anything pass him that did not first come through him. He was going to say, I'm tired of seeing this hole. I'm tired of seeing this gap, this breach where the enemy's coming in and I'm going to fill it and I'm not going to move. I'm going to stand. I'm going to remain and I'm going to endure no matter what would come. I'm going to fill in this gap so the enemy cannot get through. Are you standing in that gap tonight? The enemy is coming in through all different ways and God is just looking for someone to stand in that gap to say, I'm tired. I've had enough. I don't want anyone else to come. 
Uh, he's looking for someone that would say, no, you can't have this nation. You can't have my friends. You can't have the city. You can't have my family. You can't have my brothers, my sisters, my sons, my daughters. Will he find someone standing in that gap tonight saying, I've had enough of what the enemy's been doing, but I'm going to stand in that gap and not let the enemy come through and do what he wants. I will stand and I will remain and I will endure to not let him get to what he wants to do. Will he find someone standing in that gap tonight? And the verse would go on and it says he looked for someone to stand in the gap. And then it says before me for the land. And that phrase before me is speaking of face to face. It's, it was intimacy. It was personal. It's speaking of a one on one encounter. You see, if we want our six or if we want our intercession to be successful, we must get face to face with God. We must get one on one to God. It's not just, oh, maybe I'll pray once a day and say, God, save my family. But God, I'm going to meet you face to face. I'm going to be where you are. I'm going to get one on one and say, God, we need you to move in this area. God, we need you to come through and see soul saved. God, we need you to come and move. Will Will you get face to face with God tonight? Will you get one on one and say, God, we need you to move on our behalf? Will you go before him? Will you get face to face? Will you get personal with the Lord? And then it says that I should not destroy it. Speaking of the land, but I found none. And this right here just shows us the heart of God. Uh, he doesn't want to operate in judgment or pour out his wrath. He wants to find someone interceding, but he didn't find a single person. He said, I want to find someone praying before me that I should not destroy it, but I found none. He wants to find someone. And, and like I was saying when we were talking about the seeking and the sought after, it's not that he just messed up and he didn't. It's not that he overlooked and he didn't find anyone, but he couldn't find anyone because no one was making up that hedge. No one was standing in the gap. Will you go on behalf of your nation? Will you go on behalf of this people and say, God, we need you to move in this area. God, we need to make up a hedge. God, we need to fill in that gap so that you would not destroy this land, so that you do not act in judgment, so that you do not act in wrath. But we will stand here and say, God, we need you to come and move. Because when we don't, when he doesn't find anyone, he has to destroy it. He is a holy God. But if there was someone standing in the gap, if there was someone building up that hedge, making that wall around, them saying this is my vineyard I'm not letting the enemy come in and take my family anymore I'm not letting the enemy come in and have his way in my life but I will stand and say God we need you to move he doesn't want to operate in wrath Will he find someone? Do you understand the importance of praying on behalf of other people? He doesn't want to destroy. He doesn't want to operate in wrath. He doesn't want to pour out his judgment. But all it depends on is if he finds someone. Will he find you tonight praying those prayers? Will he find you tonight building up that wall? And will he find you tonight interceding on behalf of others? And going down to verse 31, it says, Therefore... Have I poured out my indignation and indignation is just speaking of the anger. Um, so because God couldn't or couldn't find anyone standing in that hedge or standing in the gap, he had no other choice but to operate in judgment. And just reading the end of verse 30 and 31 again, it says, I found none. Therefore, have I poured out my anger because God didn't find anyone standing in the gap. He had to operate in wrath because no one was doing it. Will he find someone in this room tonight? I'm just trying to bring out the importance because he found none. Therefore, I had to operate in anger. Will he find you? Do you understand what you have tonight? You have the power to withhold the wrath of God. You have the power to pray and intercede on behalf of people and see the grace of God move in their lives. Do you understand what you have? tonight. Your friends don't have to go to hell. Your family doesn't have to be lost. You have the power. Will he find you praying for them tonight? Will he find you standing in the gap? Will he find you making up that hedge tonight? Because no one would stand in the gap, he had to operate in wrath. And this just goes to show the power of an intercessory prayer. 
Second uh, Chronicles seven fourteen says, "If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land." You see, when we pray on behalf of others, He will hear us. It's without a shadow of a doubt He will hear when we begin to pray for others. But will He hear you? Will you even say that prayer? He wants to hear you. He wants to find you. Will you do it when we intercede for people he will forgive their sin do you understand what you are capable of tonight you're capable of praying and pleading the blood over others so the enemy cannot come in and have their way in, and have his way in their life tonight uh, when we cry out for this nation he will heal our land these are all guarantees but it's all dependent and focused upon us will you make up that hedge tonight will you stand in the gap he's waiting on his people to humble himself it's time for us to realize what we have and say, God, we need you to come and move. It's not us preaching the gospel. Yes, God uses that. But the importance is us praying and making that hedge, making that gap. It's when we humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. Then he does these things. There is power in your prayer tonight. Do you understand what you're capable of doing? Will you go out and make that hedge? Will you go out and stand in that gap for that person? And now you're saying, well, that's a lot awful lot to do. How am I supposed to get this whole church to pray for someone? How am I supposed to get this whole church to do this? How am I supposed to get the whole body of Christ to intercede? Um, but I have good news for you. It doesn't take everybody. All it takes is the one person to intercede. If you take a look back at verse 30, it says, and I saw for a Man, He only sought for one person. It was only one person he was looking for. It's singular and it's not plural. It's the one person. If that one person was found, everything would have changed. If that one person was found, he would not have to pour out his indignation. This goes to show that all it takes is one person to stand in the gap and make the hedge. That would make the difference in your family's life. All it takes is one person to make the difference in your nation. All it takes is for one person to make a difference in that city. Will you be the one that says, God, I'm tired of seeing people go to hell. God, I'm tired of seeing people not operate and walk in the fullness of Christ. God, tonight I will make that hedge and claim these people as your territory. Tonight I will stand in the gap and not let the enemy come in. It only takes one person, but will you be that person? And notice that it didn't say he sought for an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. He didn't look for anyone in ministry. He didn't look for someone behind Standing, uh, standing behind this pulpit, he didn't look for a Bible college student. He just looked for an ordinary man, and that includes the women too. He just looked for a normal person. You don't have to be of great reputation. You don't have to be this big and awesome person. He's just looking for anybody. Will he find anyone tonight? No matter who you are, you still have that power of intercession waiting to be used, waiting for you to stand in the gap and build that hedge, and then the hand of God will move. It will take, or anyone can intercede on behalf of others. Anyone can cry out for souls. Anyone can make up a hedge and anyone can stand in the gap. All it takes is one person to cry out. He said he only looked for a man, just one person, and that one person will make a difference. Uh, so will you be the one that says, I'm tired of seeing people go to an eternal hell. I'm tired of watching the world around me grow more and more wicked. I'm tired of seeing family members not encounter the love of God. And I choose from this day forward to stand in the gap for those around me. Do you realize the power that is in your prayer of intercession? And it only takes one person. You can be five, year old, five years old. You can be 50 years old. And God will still hear that prayer. And God will still move. There is power in that no matter who you are, it only takes one person for God to find. And when he finds you, he will move and he will listen to your prayers. And I just have some examples here of one person standing in the gap for others. When you look at Noah, he stood in the gap for his wife, his sons and his son's wives. And they were all kept safe from the flood just because one man stood in the gap. Um, 
and he would bring them into the ark of safety. It's time for us to start bringing those people into. It's time for us, one person, it doesn't matter how many come alongside of us, but if one person would bring others into the ark of safety, they would be saved. The wrath and judgment of God are coming, but will you be that one person that makes the hedge? Will you be that one person that brings them into the ark of safety? When you look at the story of Rahab, uh, she stood in the gap for her father, her mother, her brothers, and her sister. And they were all kept safe when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down as long as she hung the scarlet cord out the window. And that scarlet cord is just a type of the blood of Jesus Christ. We must begin to plead the blood over our family. We must begin to bring them in and plead the blood of Jesus over them. And as long as we're pleading the blood, as long as we're standing in the gap for them, God will move. God kept all of them safe when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Will you be that person to bleed the blood and stand in the gap for those around you? And the last example I have is the life of Abraham. Uh, we see Abraham stand in the gap for his nephew Lot and for Lot's family. And they were all brought out of Sodom and Gomorrah before the Lord had destroyed this land. All because one man prayed. We saw a whole family be brought to safety, come out of the land. Um, and a specific point within that story I want to bring out uh, in Genesis 18.30, you see that the Lord didn't leave Abraham in the middle of Abraham's intercession, but he waited for Abraham to finish praying. You see, as long as you're praying and standing in the gap, God will keep listening. He will not turn you away as long as you continue to intercede. As long as you begin to pray, he will stay and listen. He's not going to leave you until you're done praying. He will continue to listen over and over and over. As long as you keep praying and standing in the gap, God will keep listening. Do not give up too soon. You you never know when that person is going to get home. You never know when they're going to come into the kingdom. Continue, continue, continue. You don't know how much long it's going to take, but if you keep praying, if you keep standing in the gap, if you keep building the hedge, God is going to keep listening to you, and he's not going to leave until you're done interceding. How bad do you want that person in the kingdom? Will you keep doing it no matter what it takes? Will you stand in that breach and stand in that gap no matter what may come your way when the enemy's coming in trying to get them? Will you stay there? Will you stay planted and stand firm and not move? Will you continue to stand in the gap? He will keep listening if you keep praying, continue to build up the hedge, continue to stand in the gap and continue crying out. All it takes is for one person to stand in the gap. All it takes is for one person to never give up and say, I am going to stand here and I am not going to move until I see them enter the kingdom of God. Will you be that one person? And there's a special reason I chose these three examples. Um of Noah, of Rahab, and of Abraham. Um, and that was to show you that God is in the family saving business. Noah stood in the gap for his whole family and they all came in the ark of safety. Abraham stood in the gap for his nephew and his nephew's family and they were all brought out of the city before the judgment would come. Rahab would pray for her mother, her brother, her dad, her sisters, and they would all be kept safe during the crumbling of the walls of Jericho. Um, God is in the family saving business. Uh, in Acts 17.31, we see the Philippian jailer ask Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. God wants to save your family. He didn't just save you for you, but he saved you to get to your family. He's always had the idea, I want the whole family to be saved. But will you be in the gap? Will you be making that hedge around them saying, God, you've promised me. God, I see over and over in the examples of scripture, you brought in the whole family, but it takes one person to say, I'm standing in the gap tonight. I am going to make up that hedge. Will you be that one person he finds? It only takes one and he wants to save your family. He is in the business of saving families. He doesn't just save you for you, but he saves you to reach your family. 
It's time to bring them into the ark of safety. We must continue to preach Jesus to them and they will come in. It's time for us to plead the blood of Jesus over and over and over and over. Continue pleading that blood and they will be saved. It's time for us to intercede face to face with God, just like Lot or just like Abraham did for Lot. Continue to intercede face to face and he and do not give up and the Lord would hear you as long as you're praying God is listening will you choose to stand in that gap will you choose to make up that hedge they're going to come in but we must continue to build that hedge we must continue to stand in the gap do you not know that the prayers of a righteous man availeth much do you not understand the power that is just sitting within you waiting to be used you've been believing for your family to come in but it's more than just believing it's saying God I'm gonna make up that hedge I'm claiming this for you God I'm gonna stand in the gap not letting the enemy come in anymore. It's more than just saying, God, save them. But it's getting face to face with God and not giving up. Saying, God, I will stand here and I will continue to pray because you're continuing to listen. And I will make that hedge. I will stand in the gap for my family. Do you not realize that you have the keys to the kingdom? God said you have the keys to the kingdom and all authority is given to you. You can pray. You can enter into heaven at any time, anywhere and pray and God will hear you. You have the keys to the kingdom to bind and loose things tonight. You can claim that family member. You can stand in the gap and you can build up that hedge tonight. And I know this was a short sermon. I'm always very short-winded, uh, but I'm just going to ask that you can stand with me. Um, and I hope tonight I stirred up your faith. It wasn't anything fancy. It wasn't anything special. It was just simple. I want you to understand. I want you to stand in that gap. I want you to make that hedge. I want you to realize the importance of it and the power that you have that is waiting to be used. God wants to find someone. But will he find someone in this room tonight? Will he find someone standing in that gap? Will he find someone making up that hedge? And it's time for us to make up that hedge and say, this is my territory. Devil, you can't have it. This is what I'm claiming for the Lord. You can't have it. It's my wall of defense. I've claimed what's on the inside for the Lord and the enemy cannot come in. Will you stand in the gap and say, no enemy, you can't come through. I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to endure and I'm not letting you get into my family anymore. I'm not letting you get into my friends and my coworkers. I'm not letting you get through anymore. Will you make that hedge and will Will you stand in the gap?